The subject of today's video is not a disease caused by some malevolent pathogen or even spread by mosquitoes. It is a disease that is not contagious, but is caused simply by poverty and a poor diet. Pellagra is an illness caused by a lack of vitamin B3, and its symptoms are known by the four Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. It is perhaps helpful to start with a brief description of pellagra and the importance of vitamin B3. The disease is caused if a person does not consume the required 14 to 16 milligrams of vitamin B3 a day. B3 is vital as it is one of the eight essential vitamins, helping to break down food and nutrients for the body to absorb. It is vital for the proper functioning of the nervous system, the skin and the digestive system. B3 is needed for a person's cognitive function, as it assists in the production of dopamine, serotonin, and other essential hormones in proper brain function. Vitamin B3 can be found in naturally fresh legumes, in fish, and in meat, and the body can even synthesize its own in the liver. But if a person becomes deficient in vitamin B3, then pellagra will begin to set in. In the early stages, the disease will present with little to no symptoms. A patient may notice the cold more, or even have a slowed metabolism, but it will take time for the disease to take hold. But in time, the four Ds associated with the illness will present if not dealt with quickly. The first D, diarrhea, will be common, along with mouth sores, difficulty swallowing, and vomiting. With less B3, the gastrointestinal system will begin to deteriorate, one notable symptom is the inflammation of the mucous membranes along the gastrointestinal tract, from the mouth, through the stomach, and along the intestines. This can make eating difficult and very painful, potentially making the disease even worse. As for the second D, dermatitis, symptoms will begin akin to sunburn, redness, scabby rashes on parts of the skin more exposed to the sun. On the face, neck, arms, and legs, rashes will begin to form. This then develops into blisters, and skin begins to fall off. A telltale presentation is the castle necklace, a ring around the patient's neck of rashes and darkening of the skin. Eventually, the damage done to the nervous system leads to the third D, dementia, a loss of memory. But this is not the only symptom. The patient can present with hallucinations, anxiety, insomnia, depression, delirium, and changes to their personality. The fourth D, death, will follow as the patient slips into a coma as the nervous system is damaged beyond repair and function. The treatment for the disease is simple, supplements of vitamin B3. Today, much of our food is fortified with B3, otherwise known as niacin. You may notice niacin on the labels of bread and cereal, added to fortify foods otherwise without. The reason for this will be explained later into the video. But first, we will start with the first known case of pellagra. It was first identified in the 18th century by a man named Gaspar Castle. He believed that the disease was in some way linked to diet and the atmosphere. Cases too were abundant in Italy, in poorer areas where the staple food was corn. Some believed that the crop contained a toxin that caused pellagra, whilst others thought it was akin to malaria and spread by insects. Some looked for explanations as to why the native people of America did not contract the illness. It is now understood that the process of preparing the corn, where the corn is soaked and cooked in lime water, breaks down the kernels. This means that the human body can absorb the nutrients in the corn that can be synthesized in the body into vitamin B3. But for many in the southern states of America, at the turn of the 20th century, such processes were not employed. The disease reached epidemic levels, with 3 million people affected between 1900 and 1940. The disease ravaged poorer farmers, sharecroppers, and mill workers, who lived off largely low-nutrition foods. The staple diet for many was cornmeal, molasses, and fatback, a type of dried and fried pork. Much of the cornmeal was processed in such a way that the vitamins were lost. The manufacturing process stripped the maize of tryptophan, an amino acid used in the body to synthesize its own vitamin B3. Many sharecroppers forewent growing their own food in order to grow cash crops like cotton in order to get by. 
Many workers were paid in company script, a currency that could only be used in company-owned stores, and these stores sold low-nutrition foods. In sanatoriums and orphanages, poor diets caused outbreaks of pellagra, reaching epidemic levels, the disease needed to be dealt with. It would be in the year 1914 that Dr. Joseph Goldberger was appointed to be the US government's pellagra investigator. Goldberger had already earned the reputation as a successful epidemiologist. Employed by the Public Health Service, he had dealt with outbreaks of typhus, dengue fever, and yellow fever. One of the first places Goldberger started with was at the sanatoriums and orphanages. Many believed that the disease was contagious, but Goldberger observed that doctors, nurses, and administrators of these facilities did not contract the illness. Only the inmates and children in their care were ill. If pellagra was indeed contagious, then one would expect people working in close proximity to those suffering with the disease to also contract it. Goldberger noted the diets of the staff and inmates, seeing whilst that they did share the same food, the staff got the first pick, leaving the inmates with the low-nutrition foods. Goldberger set up experiments in two orphanages, blighted with pellagra. One group was to be the control, eating what they normally would. The other was fed eggs, meat, fresh legumes and milk. In the two years that the study was conducted, there was only one new case of pellagra and almost all of the orphans experienced a full recovery. This led to further tests to prove that diet was responsible for pellagra. In one of these tests, 12 prisoners of the Rankin State Prison Farm in Mississippi were offered pardons in exchange for taking part in the experiment. They were to be sealed from the outside world in a barn and fed a low-nutrition diet, a corn-based diet, for six months. Of the 11 prisoners who completed the experiment, six contracted pellagra. One was not even able to finish the experiment, stating to the press, I have been through a thousand hells. Other prisoners even pleaded to be shot as to end their suffering, slowly succumbing to pellagra. Goldberger was trashed in the press for what was dubbed the torture of prisoners, ruining the reputation of the doctor and his findings. The governor of Mississippi, too, was accused of embezzlement, as two of the twelve prisoners who obtained pardons for participating in the experiment were his close friends. Despite seemingly proving the importance of a nutritional diet, still many rejected Goldberger's evidence that pellagra was linked to poor diet, and they continued to push that this was a contagious disease. What's more, it seemed to be linked to cotton production. When cotton crops were blighted by boll weevil infestations, and instead farmers grew food crops, pellagra rates fell. For southern leaders, if pellagra was linked to poor diet and the economic system of the south, then this would be an indictment upon their society. Some even rejected Goldberger's findings on the basis that he was a northerner and the son of Jewish immigrants. In 1921, newly elected President Harding requested that the Red Cross provide food aid in the southern states, but this aid was rejected. In a seemingly last-ditch attempt to prove that the disease was not contagious, Goldberger held what would be called filth parties. Goldberger, his wife, assistants and associates would take pellagra patients and extract the patient's blood. This blood would then be injected into Goldberger and Co. in an attempt to show that pellagra could not be contracted. Swabs were then taken from the patient's nose and throat and would then be rubbed into the nose and throats of the party guests. And perhaps most disturbing of all, pills were made. These pills were made of pellagra patient urine, scabs, and feces. These pills were then consumed. The party guests did fall ill with sickness and diarrhea, but none of them contracted pellagra. Even this was dismissed, with denies stating that Goldberger and his party guests were just more resilient than the millions affected. Rather than continue his fruitless attempts to convince the southern leaders of the nature of pellagra, Goldberger continued his research. He put efforts into working out what exactly in a healthy diet prevented pellagra from even developing. Goldberger looked to experiment into malnutrition using dogs. 
These dogs developed a similar condition to pellagra, dubbed black tongue. These dogs were fed a low nutrition food diet, but they were unable to eat due to symptoms of gastrointestinal inflammation. The researchers used brewer's yeast to encourage the dogs to eat the low nutritional food. Dogs that ate the brewer's yeast would be cured of the black tongue, indicating that yeast could work for the humans too. In 1927, the Mississippi River flooded, creating tens of thousands of refugees, living in camps and succumbing to pellagra. Goldberger visited these refugee camps and gave brewer's yeast to those afflicted. These victims of the condition recovered quickly. But after the flood receded, and brewer's yeast was no longer distributed to refugees, the levels of pellagra returned to pre-flood levels. It would not be until 1937 that niacin was identified as the vitamin in brewer's yeast, meat and milk that prevented pellagra. This discovery was made by an American biochemist named Conrad Elverhelm. Goldberger had continued the search for niacin, but died in 1929, missing out on this breakthrough. He had been nominated four times for a Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work. Following the discovery of niacin, meals and flour became fortified with the vitamin, added during production. With this, pellagra all but disappeared in the United States. Even to this day, niacin is a common vitamin in fortified foods. Some countries even mandate the fortification of maize flour and rice as a means to avoid any further outbreaks of pellagra. Today, pellagra is somewhat common in Africa, China and Indonesia. It can also appear amongst refugee communities, amongst people with malabsorption syndromes and people with substance misuse problems. However, thankfully, the disease is largely a thing of the past. Pellagra is no longer an endemic health problem. This is large part due to rises in the standard of living of small farmers who were most prone to the disease, along with a more healthy, diverse diet. Pellagra will remain one of the more disturbing deficiency conditions. From its blight of the poor and exploited, to the disgusting attempts to understand it, to the damage it can cause, Pellagra is truly a disturbing disease.